My name is Mike Driscoll, and I'm here to talk today about the cognitive design principles of interactive visual analytics. And when I was in graduate school doing my PhD, I was often said that if you want to learn a subject as a professor, you would first lead a seminar, then you would teach an undergraduate class, and then you would write a book. And so in some ways, this is like my, um, you guys are my graduate uh, seminar attempt at fleshing out some of these ideas, and I look forward to maybe chatting with some of you at the happy hour afterwards. Um, I guess why I'm here, uh, in terms of my inspiration and how I got to be someone who is so passionate, not just about visualization, but about how we interact with visualizations, was when I was in graduate school, I was working with large-scale genomics data, and I was crunching, at the time, what seemed like a lot of data, a few million data points from microarrays. And it took me a few weeks in my early graduate years to finally um, generate this graph in MATLAB, the lowly histogram. And I was so amazed at that result to take thousands and even millions of data points and distill it down to this visual artifact but I was also deeply disappointed how much effort it took to get there. And when I ended up with this histogram, it was just there, static. I couldn't tweak it, I couldn't change it, I couldn't zoom in on an area that was interesting or get further information. So I think in a lot of ways, the world of data visualization is kind of still here. You know, we're great at generating static artifacts, but I think the opportunity for all of us is to go beyond just visualizations, but actually change the way that we navigate through data visually. And so what I've called this is interactive visual analytics. And I define this as allowing a user to visually manipulate and explore an information space interactively, engaging in an analytical dialogue with data. That's ultimately what we all want to do, right, is, is be able to talk to our data. And the visual piece is, is very important, um, but ultimately I think this gets to cognitive psychology. And why are the principles of cognitive psychology so important for this? Really two main reasons. The first is that data consumption is, for humans, principally if not entirely a visual task. When we look at analytical results, we want to look at them in a way that minimizes the cognitive load when we sh share them with ourselves or a colleague, we want to do it in such a way that we maximize the, the speed with which people understand what they're looking at. And to do this effectively, we almost always need to employ data visualization. And that includes tables of numbers or also data visualizations. On the left here, I've got just a, an example of Bertin's retinal variables. And I think many of you are familiar with Jacques Bertin's work, The Semiology of Graphics. I think it's actually uh, less accessible, but in some ways deeper than a lot of Tufti's work. And I think the fundamental task of data visualization is mapping data onto these retinal variables of texture, contrast, size, color, shape, orientation. These are the variables we can manipulate when we encode data in a visual way. And that ultimately is leveraging our cognitive abilities to, to see. The second reason why cognitive psychology matters is navigation and interactive analytics. To explore data, we need to navigate through it. And there's a set of core navigational primitives that have got to be intuitive and follow a learnable mental model. So I know, frankly, I think it's very early days. For me, a lot of the navigational interfaces for data are anything but intuitive. I think we're, we are where we were when word processing was first invented and there was different modes for insert uh, and edit uh, and delete. So I'll walk through just some examples of these principles both on the visualization side and on the navigation side. At the end, I'll show a little bit of a demo of a product that we've been working on for the last few years and which we're looking to evolve and take to the next step. So what are some cognitive principles of data visualization? Well, there's many more than these, but these are a few that I thought were worth repeating. You guys are data visualiz visualization experts, so many of these should not be a surprise. The first is choose form to follow function. It's an architectural principle. 
as well as a, a visualization one. The second, uh, strive for parsimony. And the third, use or leverage a shared visual vocabulary. So I'll give some examples of each of these. The first, choosing form to follow function. I think this gets to the choices we make about how we take data and encode that data with Bertrand's retinal variables. So on the left, I show a, a, the, the lowly bar chart. This is actually from the Plotly homepage, so a little shout out to our sponsors here. And actually here we're doing it correctly. We've, we've basically got two variables that we're encoding. Well, ar arguably three if we take into account shape, the choice of a, of a bar. But the first is position. Uh, we're looking at three different times, types of animals and we're using position to encode that. Giraffes, monkeys, orangutans are all separated in space. And the second is which zoo they're at. I guess we've got the SF Zoo and the LA Zoo. And we're using color to encode that second category of data. This is very simple, but uh, you'd be surprised how often I think this simple principle is uh, not observed. So just typing in bar chart at Google, I got this other graph. What we can see here is that we are using space to encode a category. That's a category that's on the, uh, the x-axis there. But color is not functional here. It's just used merely for decorative purpose. And the, that is really a, a poor choice because it um, frankly confuses, I think, the end user. What does yellow mean? It means absolutely nothing, uh, nor does blue. So I think that, that principle of choosing your forms to follow function is really important. Never use more retinal variables than you need to. I think not only does it, of course, obviate the ability to add information to a graphic later on. For instance, in this right graph, if we wanted to compare the San Francisco and the LA Zoo for some reason, um, you would now have to change all the colors. Uh, but it also just adds more cognitive load. We have to interpret color now when there really is no need to interpret color here. Okay, v visual principle two, um, strive for parsimony. So in my opinion, I think that it's rare that there is a number that we want to show to humans where we need to show more than three significant digits. And yet, in a lot of the data tables that we see in the wild, uh, you'll often find people who like to give us uh, way more than the number of significant digits that could ever matter. Uh, so on the left here, we're talking about the GDP of the United States, I think in 2015, and we can express it with effectively uh, four glyphs. The currency glyph, 16, a period, another number, seven, and then T, which is an abbreviation for trillion. On the right, we have our fully expanded uh, down to the cent, which is almost certainly wrong, GDP of the United States of America. And you know, the interesting thing about um, numbers, and certainly our base 10 system, is that the leftmost digits encode 10 times as much, have 10 times as much impact as anything to the right of them. So in a lot of ways, when you look at a column of, num of, a column of digits, you're actually looking at a logarithmic bar chart because anything that's got four digits versus three is showing you that something that's slightly larger, um, it actually is giving you a sense of the scale. Anyway, please never show a table with that many <laughs> digits in it. It's very hard for humans to read. Um, I go a step further here. If you actually show tables of numbers, I think you can very quickly see that the number of digits, the amount of ink you put on the screen can multiply greatly if you're not careful in observing this law of parsimony. So in the uh, top, again, I show just the fully expanded um, numeric data. And on the bottom, I show uh, an encoding where we only show three significant digits per, um, in general, three significant digits per column of, of numbers. There's some additional logic here, which is that it's very important when you look down a column that you're um, having the same, the same scale. So, and in some cases, um, to achieve that, you may either increase or decrease the number of digits you show. So I think there's basically about twice as many digits on the top table as there is in the bottom. Okay, third principle. Use natural visual vocabulary. So 
as data visualization experts, we're often tempted to show off the latest and greatest visual form that we may have discovered in a scientific paper or in our graduate work. And I certainly have been known to incorporate things like Bollinger Bands in some of our early products uh, at Metamarkets. But the truth is that we really are still in the early days of visual literacy. And while not everyone is as poorly visual liter visually literate as maybe readers of the USA Today, I think that most people are not capable of consuming some of the higher end visualizations that uh, many of us are familiar with. But there are a number of, of data visualization forms that have been around for a long time. And this graph here is actually the world's oldest time series graph. It's from a 10th century manuscript. What's showing is how the planets uh, move in the sky uh, over time. So what you see here is that the idea of a time series chart where the x-axis is time and the y-axis is some, some measure of something else is a pretty old form. And so you never want to show a time series where maybe you've rotated or, or mutated that form. Most humans, most business users can be put in front of a time series and make sense of it. Another example of using natural visual vocabulary is when choosing colors. So beyond the fact that most color, uh, this is an example of a heat map. In a heat map, going back to that first principle of never use more retinal variables than you need, most heat maps you can and you should only use two colors. But when choosing what those two colors are, and here's, I'm not exactly uh, following that rule here, but when choosing color, it's not a bad thing to map color choices to natural choices. So if you are going to be showing temperature, as we're showing here, uh, it's perfectly fine to put white hot as uh, white and yellow, and then cooler colors as black. And I think that is also true in, in other choices out there. You may choose to, to leverage a visual vocabulary that people already have. Another example is if you're comparing um, two time series, oftentimes it's good to show a past time series in a more faded color. I think that's a natural vocabulary for us because typically things that are older have more of a faded look to them. Okay, so next, what are some basic cognitive principles of data navigation? And I'll say here again, I think it's very early days for us understanding what are some of the, the better principles to leverage. But I, I name four of them here. So the first is allow direct manipulation. The second is give instant feedback. The third is avoid modes. And the fourth is encourage playful exploration. So direct manipulation. In a lot of ways, when we, when we design user interfaces, in, in the same way that uh, whether we like it or not, we're stuck with our eyes as a way to encode data visually, when it comes to designing interfaces or navigational patterns, we really are stuck with this history of you know, thousands or millions of years of evolution for how humans have interacted with the world. And the way that most of us have interacted with the natural world is that if we want to change something, we go over to it and we touch it. We grab it and we change it. And I put this faucet up here because I think it, faucets and a lot of other everyday things are often very highly evolved in their interfaces while they look simple. And if anyone's ever uh, struggled finding like a foot pedal for a faucet, you know that it makes a lot of sense to place controls near or on the things that they control. So most faucets actually put the handle for turning the water on right above the water spout. <laughs> and we take that for granted. But in a lot of user interfaces for data, I, I often find that there is spooky action at a distance. And we know that spooky action at a distance is confusing to us because it doesn't make sense. It's not how our brains think about the way the physical world is, is mapped. So an example of the, I'm not observing this rule, is that in a lot of data tables that I see out in the world, this is from a Microsoft product, we often will show people a table, we often show people a table of data, but if they want to manipulate that table, if they want to sort, or if they want to add or remove a column, there's often this 
kind of spooky controller off in the right-hand side of the interface that they have to go to, and there they can manipulate all sorts of elements of the table. I think that's, frankly, unfortunate, because a lot of people who use or interact with data really just want to go and say, get rid of that column, or sort it differently, or add something to it. And I think it takes a little more work for us as the designers of data visualizations, again, I include tables as one of those, um, to make the manipulations a bit more accessible. Okay, second principle is instant feedback. And I show here the example of uh, a piano. I think pianos and musical instruments are wonderful examples of providing instant feedback for things. And lots of other examples are a seatbelt. When you, you know, when you click it in, you hear that very satisfying click to know that the seatbelt is, is there. I think with a lot of computer interfaces, particularly programming interfaces, we often find, um, for any number of reasons, that there's a delay in feedback. And it's that delay that actually, I think, does not work well with our, uh, our caveman brains. We're expecting when we, when we change something to get something, uh, recognition of that change. And there's a quote from a talk by Brett Victor, which I, many of you may have seen, and if you haven't, I suggest you check it out, um, Inventing on Principle. And in that talk, he has a quote where he says, if there is any delay in that feedback loop between thinking of something and seeing it and building on it, then there's this whole world of ideas which will just never be. I think for those of us who are working with data, we're often asking questions and, and we are attempting to test an idea, to explore a hypothesis. And it's not just, of course, the visual, uh, the interactive interface itself. Oftentimes, when data gets very large, naturally there's a delay because the systems, the engines that are powering our data visualizations can get slow. But in terms of designing navigational and interactive interfaces for data, I think we really ought to strive as much as possible to give instant feedback to users so that they can be in, in a lot of ways composers of data the same way that a lot of people are composers of music. Okay, third principle is avoid modes. This is another Brett Victor uh, shout out. So again, the physical world that we live in is not one that has a lot of modes your sunglasses behave the same way basically all the time when you grab them. And I think a great example of where modes can cause us cognitive dissonance and often lead to disaster, having Ben Zone who drove my car into a garage door uh, a couple of years ago, is the idea that the gas pedal in a car in one mode goes forward. But if you put your car into reverse, the gas pedal does something different. It's now a reverse mode. And it's probably an artifact of history uh, that someone designed cars to work this way. But when you incorporate modes into systems, it creates a lot of cognitive load for people. They need to remember, what mode am I in? Am I in the reverse mode? Am I in the uh, forward mode? And for a lot of navigational interfaces I've seen for data, um, oftentimes we're forcing users into um, edit mode or read-only mode uh, or insert um, new filter mode, and these modes actually can be very confusing and I think off-putting. And fourth, and I think this kind of gets to um, this original sort of description of what interactive visual analytics is. It's about allowing humans to detect and figure out a learnable model of the system. Very, very few of us actually read instruction manuals. And I think, you know, I was thinking about this last night. You know, if you think about, you know, this device, which many of us have in our pocket, the world's most valuable company on the planet has effectively been built on, of course, good user interface. And I don't think there's a single one of us in here that's ever read an instruction manual for our smartphone. That's what we should aspire to for designing navigational interfaces for data. Something that people can play with and explore and take, click some things and see what happens. And it's that play, again, going back to how we, 
have evolved as humans. It's by playing with things that we figure out how they work. So in designing navigational interfaces, I think as much as possible, if you can uh, incorporate that notion, you will, your users will, will like you. So uh, here I, I talk a little bit about what exploration is. So there's a, there's a set of navigational primitives for data. And I don't think this is a complete set. But fundamentally, what do people want to do when they are confronted with a large-scale data set? They want to search it. That, that makes a lot of sense. They want to filter on it, in include or exclude items. They want to sort it lexicographically, or they want to sort it according to some numeric quantitative um, dimension. They want to pan or zoom on it or page through a, a categorical dimension. And possibly most, the most complicated thing we can do with large-scale, high-dimensional data sets is we want to relate dimensions to each other. There's a set of primitives there, all of which are different, joining dimensions, um, nesting them underneath each other and or crossing them. So, you know, my goal and, and what I've been thinking a lot about in the last few years is how we can actually build an interactive visual exploratory tool that allows humans to have a much, I think, more healthy relationship with data sets and to be able to achieve some of the visual artifacts that took me weeks to achieve uh, in seconds and then to engage in an, an interactive analytical dialogue with that, with those artifacts. So that's all I've got. I, I'll open it up to some questions uh, at the end here. I've got some further reading. I would say the, probably the most important book that I've ever read for understanding the cognitive psychology of perception is Colin Ware's Information Visualization. I think it's in its third edition now. Um, Brett Victor's talk, Designing on Principle, is a great one. And uh, the third one, Dana Wong, is a, I find to be a very practical guide for the design of mostly tables in, um, uh, in written form. So thanks very much for listening, and I'll, I'll open it up to any questions if there are any. Um, one thing I'm always somewhat curious about is, you know, in most of these design principles, like how, mon how many of the principles are based on like actual user tests? Like, I mean, the example I always come to my mind, comes to my mind is how pie charts have fallen out of favors, it seems, for the last few years. And I always wonder, like, did, like, did we do tests about pie using pie charts with stack bar charts and seeing if they did, or is it these are more cognitive principles? I think the, probably the truth is always somewhere in between. So, you know, there's, there's lots of ways to get at truth. One is empiricism and one is, you know, theory. Uh, I think the reason why, you know, pie charts have fallen out of favor probably has a, a bit to do with both. But, um, you know, I think we can, we can theoretically understand that one of the challenges of the pie chart is that you encode information in position that is actually meaningless. So when you have more than just a part to a hole in a pie chart, depending on how you rotate that pie chart, you can end up artifactually conveying different information and people can perceive it differently. So I think there's, there's some theoretical just limitations of, of pie charts. Um, and then, you know, lots of folks like Colin Ware will do studies where they'll, they'll measure how quickly a user can detect an insight. So a lot of psychologists are doing studies to see how quickly our brains can uh, ingest information. And I mean, I don't know about you, but a pie chart with like 50 slices is basically useless. So I was looking at some of your, your graphs and uh, I just finished teaching a course in which uh, I was dealing with graduate students that I, I had a certain expectation of their visual representation skills and it was not always met, uh, including false precision and crazy color choice. And I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about uh, ways of encoding these design patterns into software 
and it's, it's, it's a really hard point, so I deal with GIS cartographic software all the time, mm -hmm. and it remains painfully dumb about, you know, really basic elements of Burton stuff that's been known for 100 years. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so have you thought about how, or I don't know, the mechanism through libraries or through other, other elements that go from design guidelines uh, towards uh, software defaults or helping software designers uh, generate behavior that's kind of consistent with these design principles? Sure, I mean, I, I think even for us, and I realized I was gonna show a demo of our product, um, but I decided just to go straight to Q&A, but, but maybe to answer your question in part by showing the product a bit. You know, we, we don't let people, I think good design means that you, you limit the number of choices you give to your users. And so I think the goal is as much as possible, as you said, to set up good defaults that prevent somebody from encoding information you know, uselessly in additional variables of color or position uh, while, while exposing to them um, you know, kind of safe, safe places to go. So I, I do think a lot of the, I guess I think of like word processing software or you know, um, something like Donald Knuth's you know, LaTeX he's given, he's set up a lot of good defaults, and so the goal of the user is not maybe to make all of those choices, but to tell you what their, what their goals are, and then some of the visual choices, many of the visual choices we should make for them. Um, but, you know, I, I think it's still very, it's early, I think it's early dates. I think we've just basically gotten to finally being able to visualize data somewhat effectively, and so then creating this, the next layer up of knobs to tune those visualizations is definitely a, um, an open and active area of work. So I guess you're part of that, trying to get your students to do it correctly. Uh, so one thing that I've seen with uh, technology companies, especially global companies, uh, one of the largest things you can do with user interfaces is uh, have to redesign them for different markets for like east versus west or you know right oriented versus left oriented text and things like that. In terms of data visualization, what do you think the challenges are uh, of making universal data visualizations, especially as a global company where you might have consumers that are looking at your data all around the world? I think it's a, it's a great question. Probably more than, than in the past, we do live in a fairly global world. I, I think about every hotel I've ever gone to in the world has orange on their coffee pots to indicate decaf. You want to avoid that in the morning when you're getting your coffee. So there's a lot of universal symbology I think that's emerging. I think that's the opportunity. I think a lot of um, probably printed materials. We have, we have things that were designed you know, 100 years ago or even human computer interfaces that were designed in the 70s. But with data visualization, I think we do have an opportunity to have a more global um, set of, uh, of, of defaults or vocabularies. But I think it's, it's a great question because some of what I said earlier around choosing sort of natural vocabularies, you know, the color red has a very different meaning in the Western world than it does uh, in APAC. So, so many of our interfaces, you know, even Facebook, um, uses red as a very strong kind of alert color where in other cultures that's, you know, it, it doesn't quite have that same connotation of alert or beware. So it's a great question. I, I don't have a great answer for it, but we can try. Hi, uh, thanks for a great talk. Uh, you just mentioned that uh, good design is about like limiting the amount of freedom you give to your end users. So how do you feel about like uh, building interactivity into your plots because a part of it that we want also is uh, enable people to explore the data, be data scientists themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, so there should be like a fine line where we also give them controls and they can explore, right? Yeah, so I, I think it's, um, yeah, it's, a, it's a hard question in terms of how much control or how much exploratory um, always, the, I think the real challenge with interactive data visualization is you're threading this needle or trying to balance exploration with um, being expository. So in some cases you want to 
you know, here I want to tell a story perhaps about what's happened month to date with the number of edits uh, on, you know, all of Wikipedia. But, um, so I, you know, I think ultimately it's about what the user's goal is and I think what we want to do is, cr is, is not open up all avenues of exploration but open up, expose the right knobs that let them answer what might be a relevant set of, of questions. So, um, you know, I, I was thinking when I was making this talk about uh, if any of you guys have ever played like uh, the earlier Nintendo kind of Mario games and there are certain games out there where um, they allow you to do some really powerful exploration of that world they've created, but it's in a very controlled, in a controlled way. Um, you, can't, you can't take your character anywhere or do anything um, with him or her. So I think, yeah, I think, I think it's about sort of choosing the right knobs. You know, we don't let people choose colors here. We don't let them choose uh, something other than a time series to show, um, to show the relationship between time and any metric. Um, bar charts are not an option here. So um, I think you know, we're, we, we've worked hard to just expose the right knobs to people so they don't get into a, a bad or confusing state. I think the other thing is with exploration is you always want to create a way for people to get home easily. So repeatable and reusable navigation. If we think about the web browser, for instance, um, I think it took us a long time to build web browsers in such a way that we felt like we didn't get kind of lost um, and we could get back to a home page or we could use bookmarks and other kind of um, crutches to help us re resume a state um, and get, you know, get safely home to where we were before. Great, I think that's all we have time for. Thanks everyone, thanks for the great questions.